chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Let me read that for us. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Which things you have heard and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Today we transition in our passage in Philippians chapter 4 when we're coming very close to the end. Paul has come and he is finishing up his, these uh, lists of commands, these gospel-worthy commands, commands for those if you want to know what it means to conduct yourself as a good citizen, worthy of the gospel, balanced out with the gospel of Christ, these are commands that Paul has given to the Philippian believers. This is what they need to stand firm in. In verse 1 he says, My beloved brethren, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord. And he calls them my beloved. So these are the commands that Paul gives so that they would stand and firm and steadfast, immovable in conduct, worthy of the gospel. We have talked about how that conduct issues forth in unity, and that they need to pursue and do all that they can to maintain the unity, even to the point where Paul would call out these two sisters in the Lord, Euodia and Syntyche, and call his good, true yoke fellow, Sisygus, to come and help them. Conduct worthy of the gospel, steadfastness in the faith, must have an unbreakable unity and a loving, all-out effort to maintain it. We won't let and should not let anything to come in and divide the church. We shouldn't let little things Small things, non-gospel issues divide the church. Not only that, but a steadfast church seeking to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel will be always joyful in the Lord. Always joyful in the Lord. Not that life is always easy. Not that you have been insulated in this bubble away from sorrow and, and pain. But there are always ample reasons to rejoice in the Lord. Also, just a, a gracious forbearance. Because we know that the Lord is near, we should let our gracious forbearance be known to all men. This is what we should be known for. Not those who are fighting and scraping for your rights, but we stand knowing that we are immovable in the gospel issue, gospel level things, but we are graciously forbearing in everything else. And those who are steadfast in the faith and have conduct worthy of the gospel, we're not worried about anything. It's not that we're not concerned, and we talked about concern. It's okay to have concerns. There are biblical right things to be concerned with, but we ought not... We ought not to ever have our concerns grow or degrade down into sinful worry or anxiety. We take our concerns and we bring them to God in prayer with thanksgiving. This is how concerns then are stepping stones into the throne of grace. Encouragements towards prayer with thanksgiving. And from that, we, we suggest to you, it's the peace that God enjoys and has enjoyed for all eternity and in, into eternity future between the Trinity. That peace guards you. Because just as a stable, loving relationship in the home guards the promises and the blessings of the home, even infinitely more so, the unbreakable stability of the relationship within the Trinity guards us 
and assures for us that all of God's promises, gospel promises, are true, and they will come to pass. Now, we come here, and he says, finally. Now, we still have verse 10 through 23 to go, so what is he talking about? Well, as I mentioned, what he's doing is he's summing up the last part of he purposes for them to know that his circumstances have turned out for the progress of the gospel. He builds up from there, talking about his own circumstances, so that they would always conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, whether he hears of them or comes and sees them. And this is the tail end of that. But he also had another purpose, right? Because he's responding to them sending Epaphroditus along with a gift while he is in prison. They heard of his imprisonment. They sent one of their best, Epaphroditus, to him along with a gift. Epaphroditus almost died in his sickness. He gambled his life, but he came and served the Lord, served Paul. And now he's sending them back, and he's responding to that. And then we'll talk in verse 10 through 23 of his contentment, his Christ's sufficiency. But today, we're going to talk about gospel-worthy thinking. Gospel-worthy thinking. In verses 8 and 9, you will see gospel-worthy thinking, verse 8, and you will see gospel-worthy practice or living, verse 9. We won't be able to get to verse 9 today, but in verse 8, in, under gospel-worthy thinking, you will see the command, and then you will see the content. The command to dwell on these things and the content. What should we dwell on? And we'll talk about that. And hopefully by the end, you will be convinced that we need to be actively pursuing right thinking. We need to actively take control of our thoughts and our thinking. We need to make wise choices of where we spend our effort, time, and attention for our thoughts. And we need to aim our thoughts at what God says. So that's where we're heading. So since we're talking about thinking and what we're thinking about, I'm going to force myself and you to go through some really awkward silence. And I'm going to commit to four minutes. And four minutes of awkward silence is near an eternity. Now, the longer I talk and intro this, the shorter that four minutes will be because I... I want to leave myself time to finish. During this time, I want you to think. I want you to think. I'm not saying what to think about. I just want you to think. And in your thinking, I want to, for you to make observations and notice what you think about. You need to write it down or, you know, type it in so you'll remember. Do that. Okay? I want you to think and be observant about what you're thinking for the next three and a half minutes. Okay? So go ahead and do that.
So, what did you think about? Now, this would be great in a CE class where we can share together. I would love to hear what you thought about. And for those of you on live stream, if that three and a half minutes or so was really long for those of you sitting here, that must have been really excruciatingly long back at home. Or you just got up and grabbed a coffee or a hash brown or something. But here's what I thought about. I thought about the noise that the air conditioner was making. I thought about my next question. What are you going to think about? Or what, what did you think about? I thought about the conversation that I had with my boys. I thought about the hymn, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us, and how thinking about what we should be thinking about and what we should be dwelling on and how much we need to come to our shepherd and say, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us, much, much we need thy tenderness thought about the car sounds in the back. I thought about diapers. I don't know why that popped into my head. Praise the Lord, we haven't had diapers for a long time. And I thought about, oh God, would you help us in our thinking? So what did you think about? And I wanted us for, to go through that exercise because I'm not sure how much we think about what we think about. I'm not sure how much importance you place upon your thoughts. Because have you asked yourself, what have I thought about this week? What would you say that you spent the most of your time thinking about? Would you even know? How would you characterize yourself as it pertains to what you think about? Why am I asking you these things? Why am I asking you in these ways? Because I want you to take careful consideration and careful calculations on how you spend the currency of your thoughts. And it's not just me. It's because this is what the Bible says. Just like looking at your checkbook, your receipts, your credit card bills, and your bank statements, I should be able to tell you very, very easily what your priorities are and what's important to you. This ledger is even more clear. Checking the ledger of your thinking will tell you what actions will come, what words will be said, even what your future and eternal destiny will be. If you take and track the ledger of your thoughts, and if you don't, God already does, this will tell you what your actions will be, what words will you say, and what your future will be, and even your eternal destiny. And you might be thinking, is that an overstatement? Is that just some preacher... You know, exaggeration? I don't think so. Here's why. It's because everything man-made that you see in this room and in life, everything that you see that is man-made, everything that you hear, everything that you read, has started with a thought. Those thoughts led to other thoughts. Those thoughts led to plans. And those plans were put into words, and those words were put into action. Revise and repeat, and voila, you have everything that man has made. From the pews that you're sitting on, the cars in the parking lot, the laws that are put in place, organizations that are formed, governments that stand and fall, books that are written, movements, ideologies, theories, philosophies, all of these started with a thought. That's why someone has said, sow a thought, right? So, like sowing seeds. Sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. 
Our thoughts, if we keep thinking, thinking them, will issue forth in actions. Those actions, as we keep repeating those actions based on these thoughts that we think will become a habit, those habits will then become part of our character. And those character, that character, if unchanged, will chart a course for our destiny. That's why Proverbs 23, 7 says, As he thinks within himself, so he is. The reason why I want us to think about our thinking and what it is that we think about is because ideas have consequences. Whether you are actively thinking about something or another, or you are passively going along with what others are thinking about, those ideas have consequences. We know this, right? And I'm not trying to get into things, but here are some thoughts. You know, the thought was like, you know, it, it feels bad to lose. We don't want people to feel bad. So therefore, everybody is a winner. Seems like some good thoughts. Until that thought is sown and that brings forth a harvest of, well, if everybody is a winner, that means everybody also is a loser. That means skill, aptitude, effort, achievement has been devalued. It doesn't matter how hard you try, everybody's a winner. It doesn't matter how many goals you score, everybody's a winner. So put in no effort. Don't learn the rules. Just run around. Winner! Or thoughts like, there is no absolute truth, or Related to that, everybody can define what is their truth. Those have consequences. Or thoughts like, man is basically good, or stated in a more Christianese type of way, I'm not that bad. My sin is not that bad. Those have consequences. Romans 8 gives the ultimate eternal consequences of ideas starting in verse 5 of Romans chapter 8. For those who are according to the flesh, that their mind minds on the things of the flesh. And flesh here is talking about sinful flesh. Okay? Sinful earthly desires. For those who are according to the flesh, set their mind minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Why does he say this? For the mind set on the flesh is... What's the consequence of those ideas? Death. But the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Ideas have consequences. That's why... You should listen to 2 Corinthians 10 as Paul talks about thoughts. He's describing his ministry, and he says, For though we walk in the flesh, this is now he's using flesh in the sense of like human physicality, right? Not in sinful flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of forces, fortresses. Now, what fortresses are... Is he talking about like Jericho and the walls of Jericho, physical fortresses? Like you can go to Fort Knox and take out that fortress because you have divinely powerful weapons? No. He describes it as we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing I raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And he says he sums up the response of that every person who, who's been justified by faith in Christ alone, their response should be, Romans 12, 2, to not be conformed or pressed into the mold of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable. 
perfect. The way that you avoid being pressed into the sinful mold of the world is that you must be renewed in your mind, your thoughts. Notice that it doesn't say actions first, or even feelings first. It says you must be renewed in your mind. So, what thoughts do you sow? Because you sow those thoughts, those are the actions that you will reap, and so on and so forth. So what do you think about? But I don't want you to focus so much on what is it that you think about. Really, the question and the focus where we should have is, what should you and I be thinking about? Because we're on varying level degrees of what we're thinking about, varying levels of that. But we need to be asking ourselves, what should we all be thinking about? Where should we spend the majority, the bulk of our time, if not all our time, thinking about? Well, this is what Paul is talking about in verse 8. He says, finally, brethren. Paul is bringing his final commands of the epistle. He is summing up what it takes to remain steadfast and standing firm in gospel-worthy conduct, as I mentioned. Paul summarizes and wraps it, up, uh, wraps it all up in two commands. Dwell on these things, verse 8, and do these things, verse 9. The command to have gospel-worthy thinking and gospel-worthy living. So then, what is the command? You can see that at the end of verse 8. Dwell on these things, New American Standard. Think about, think on, meditate in other translations. This word here, logizomai, dwell, has much more than just simply think about it. It actually has the idea of take careful calculation, careful consideration, ponder, muse, meditate even. Not only is it talking about us making judgments about what we think about and making careful calculations, but it's not just by an individual because it's second person plural. You all. You all dwell on these things if we're in Texas. It's all of us. So not only is this something that we do individually, but this is something that we do together as a church. We all as a church need to dwell on these things, carefully consider, carefully calculate. And the verb is present tense, which has a continual aspect to it. We all should continuously think and meditate, carefully consider all these things. This should be the habit and habitual pattern of us as individuals, Christians, and us as a church. See, I say again, Christianity is a thinking religion. It must have careful consideration, careful calculations of what thoughts are right. It is not mindless. It is not emotions-driven. We'll talk more about that later. We carefully consider. And before you say, oh, man, that's, that's a little bit too much. I, I remind you that you do this already. You do this already. Where? Take, for example, your vacation. You do this already for your vacations. You carefully consider where you're going to go, when you're going to go, how you're going to go, what you're going to do, what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. You carefully consider all of these things. How much is it going to cost? Your retirement, where you're going to go to school. Do I like this school? Do I want to be close to my parents? Do I want to be far away from my parents? Do I like the majors that they offer? Do I like the campus? Do I like the dorm? Do I? You carefully consider all these things. But these things, in light of the Bible, are so light, fluffy. 
And if we invest so much time and energy to think about these things, why not much more the Bible? Wouldn't it be the fool who does not consider and take careful consideration of his thinking and put it in the balance scale against conduct worthy of the gospel? How can we give so much consideration to fleeting, temporal things? They're not evil, but they're fleeting and temporal, as opposed to where we will spend in eternity. This would be like, and I know none of you would do this, this would be like, in, as far as vacations, you spending weeks and weeks and weeks planning what hat you are going to wear on your vacation but never giving thought to where you're going to go, what you're going to do, how you're going to get there. You spend all your time thinking about what hat am I going to wear. But you give no time to thinking about the actual vacation. Or, as it applies to going to school, it would be like spending money, time, researching, and considering and testing out what mechanical pencil you're going to use for college but never apply for college or med school. Never take any tests. Never prepare, never visit. Never do any of those things. Never pay the tuition and the like. But you know what mechanical pencil you're going to use. We carefully consider about these things. Why not all the more? This thing. For those of you who can't see live stream, I'm pointing to the Bible. But you might say to me, Pastor, I'm too old for these types of considerations and calculations. Or you might say, I'm too young. I'm way past going to college and considering that. I've, I'm already in retirement. You know, I'm just, I'm just living life. I don't, I, I don't want to think. I don't want to, I've, I've done my thinking. I've done my effort. I just, I'm just living life. Or you might be saying, I'm too young to do that. I'm too young. What do I need to do with this type of thing? Well, listen to Proverbs 14, verse 15 and 16. It says, The naive believes everything, but a sensible, wise man considers steps. A wise man is cautious and turns away from evil, but a fool is arrogant and careless. I would say, especially to the older of you, that you are more free than most to consider life and dwell on these things. Listen, I was talking years ago to a, an engineer, a computer engineer, a, a programmer. He says, you know what? I can't think about God's Word and program at the same time. I can't do that. I have to focus. It requires focus and attention to make sure that I don't introduce errors into the line of code because it takes twice as long to try and find the error going back. So I have to fully concentrate for 8 to 10 hours a day programming code. He says, so, so he has to do that. That's part, of, that's part of his godly life, to be a faithful worker and a computer programmer. But see, those of you who are retired, you don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to think about pharmaceuticals and how they, this pharmaceutical interacts with this one. For those of you in education, you don't have to think about lesson plans anymore, like Diane. You don't have to think about those things anymore. You are more free than any of us to dwell on these. Now remember, this is not the common word to just think. It's, it's a reckoning. That's why it's the careful calculations. It's counting up, dwelling repeatedly on these things. It's not, it is not the beast touching upon the flower that gathers honey, but her abiding for time upon them and drawing out the sweet. It is not he that reads most, but he that meditates most on divine truth that will prove the choicest, wisest, strongest. 
So that's why we need to heed the word of God in 1 Peter where it says, Therefore, verse 13, 1 Peter 1, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that phrase, prepare your minds, literally, it's gird up the loins of your mind. And so this was during a time when men would wear long flowing robes, like togas. Okay? And so you ladies, you understand, you who wear long dresses, you understand, you, you can't move super fast in long flowing dresses. You can't like full out sprint, right? And so these men were farmers and artisans, but they were also the soldiers and the militia for the city. So when an attack came, you know what they did? They girded up their loins, so they took the loose parts of their flowing robe, and they grabbed it and cinched it up together, tied it, and tucked it into their belt so that when it was time to fight, they wouldn't get caught up in their arms or legs in this long flowing robe of theirs. Neither would a strong wind come and blow the thing over their face, and then they die. They girded up the loins of their mind, or they girded up the loins of their, their robe. And, and Peter is saying, literally, gird up the loins of your mind. Don't let your thoughts just flap in the wind. Take them under control, cinch them up, and tuck them into your belt so that you will be ready for action. Well, how do we do this? Well, I haven't told you what to think on yet, but at least here's some practical things to consider, admit to. If you are going to dwell on these things and obey this command, you must commit to a time. This is not just passing, right? Fleeting thoughts. This is you actively choose to invest time to think about, I am going to think about Blank, and we'll fill in that blank shortly. But you have to invest time. If you don't invest time, you're not going to do it. You're not going to do it, or you're not going to do it well. So commit to a time. Number two, commit to a quiet and undistracted space. Now, I know that there's a spectrum of you. Some of you like to think with headphones in. Some of you like to can think in a Starbucks or whatever and all the, the noise just becomes white noise to you. You're not distracted. But you go to a place where you are undistracted. So that you might focus on these thoughts. Now, I'm also thinking about moms, especially young moms, or grandparents who are taking care of young kids. <laughs> that quiet, undistracted space seems like it is on Mars or something. It's near impossible to get there. But little by little, try and find those times. Sometimes it's in the bathroom, you know? <laughs> like, door closed and... One, one mom, I don't know why I remember this illustration, one mom who would walk around in her apron and just taking care of the house, she would just flip her apron over her head. And over time, she taught her kids, when mom has an apron over her head, that's her time with God. And it wasn't long, you know, two to five minutes or whatever, but they just learned eventually, and they were trained. <laughs> Mom's praying. Don't bother mom. And that was her quiet, undistracted space. So I recognize these are things that we must fight for. Men, you need to do this too, right? Because the tyranny of the urgent, work and all that stuff, tired after yard work. Find a quiet time and an undistracted place. Not only that, number three, commit to putting in effort. Know that this is going to be work. It's going to take effort. It's not going to be easy. It's not just going to all of a sudden, you know, you're thinking thoughts like Jonathan Edwards. It's going to take time. It's going to take time. But commit to putting in effort and then commit to being patient and enduring. Keep on doing. 
trust God that if you keep on doing this, the promise will come. The promise is that the God of peace will be with you. Not only is this good because he commands it, but he promises that the God of peace will be with you if you do think on these things and do these things. So here's some suggestions for this week and ongoingly. For this week, just observe your thinking. I'm not asking you to ongoingly observe your thinking. You can choose to do that if you want. But just take stock of what you think about. Ask yourself, what do I think about? And then record it, what you think about. And then look back on what you think about and see if this lines up in the balance scale of conduct worthy of the gospel, thinking worthy of the gospel. You can ask yourself, what do I want to think about? Because sometimes life is full and you've you got laundry and you've got all these things, but there are times when you have a quiet space, just like I gave you three and a half minutes, where no one's demanding you. And what do you want to think about? Where does your mind gravitate towards? When is, your mind is not engaged in things, What do you think about? So that's the command. Dwell, consider, ponder these things. Now, for the time that we have remaining, we'll try and cover a little bit of, well, what should we dwell on? What are these things that we should dwell on? That's found after the words, finally, brethren, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise. Now, if you have a hard time remembering lists, but you have an easier time remembering lists when it's put to song, I would encourage you to look up Seeds Family Worship, and the song is called Think About and it goes based off the NIV, but the translation is, is good. And, and you'll, you'll do this. True, noble, right, pure, lovely, uh, admirable, excellent. And then what's, the, yeah, something worthy of praise. And you'll remember all eight of them. So that's for free. But as we read through this list, hopefully you noticed the six times the word whatever was used. Notice that Paul didn't write whatever is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely. It's whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, so on and so forth. This relative pronoun becomes very important because this pronoun puts the true, the noble, the pure, the lovely into the realm of anything and everything. It would include things pertaining to God, the Bible, but also everything in the world, whether seen or unseen, in general. Now, why do I bring this out? Because it's a word of caution or some words of caution. We have to take the Bible at face value and what it says. Say everything that it says and nothing that it doesn't. Because some people come to this and say, whatever is true, honorable, right, well, that's Jesus. So you just think about Jesus and only Jesus. And that's not bad, right? I'm not saying that's bad. Don't hear me. But when you say, then you only think about Jesus, then you're not actually doing what the passage says. It says, whatever is true, not just the truth. Whatever has to mean whatever. That means anything in the universe that reflects what is true, honorable, right, pure, etc. can be considered and thought about. This opens up a whole wide world of whatever you think about Anything and everything. 
any subject, any topic, any aspect, any avenue of life. If there are things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, excellent, worthy of praise, you can think about those things. So by implication, you don't have to think about the false, the erroneous, the impure, immoral, despicable, sleazy, grotesque, base things. You don't have to think about those things. But, even though whatever means whatever, and should mean that, whatever is true, whatever is pure, right? Because you and I, sadly still, have so much of us that remains where we slither down to the lowest common denominator, and we're satisfied with what barely passes as true, noble, pure, when we, we, we just, just slide into what the lowest common denominator, and we're satisfied with what barely passes for excellent. When we're satisfied with mud pies instead of the feast, we're satisfied with the trash of this world instead of the treasure, we need to ask ourselves, even though whatever means whatever, we need to ask ourselves, are the things that I'm thinking about and dwelling upon and considering, am I doing it in such a way that points me toward that which is most reflective of what is true, noble? So what I'm saying is, you can think about a flower. That's you can put it in the pure category. Okay. The blooming of a flower. That can be put into the noble category. Lovely, even. Excellent. Worthy of praise. You can think about a flower. Now, we have to be careful and discerning that this thinking of the flower is not the most reflective of what is excellent and worthy of praise and lovely. There are things that are more lovely than this flower. So here's where we start to violate the true category. Say, oh, flowers. Flowers are so beautiful. Flowers are so lovely. And they are the loveliest of all. And that's where you violate what's true. Because flowers are not the loveliest of all. God is. So, it's not that you can only think about the Bible and Jesus, although that wouldn't be bad for us. It's you should be able to think about things like flowers and babies and cookies and whatever and enjoy them in such a way that it points you to that which is most reflective of whatever category you're in. This flower is lovely, but the loveliest of all. Fairer than lilies in sweetest bloom is Jesus. Does that make sense? We need discernment, not monasticism. We need discernment, not self-righteous legalism. That means anything, anything that you see and is around you that is good, true, pure, excellent, worthy of praise, so on and so forth, and launch you into thoughts of glory of God. Isn't that what Psalm, one, uh, Psalm 19 says? The heavens declare the glory of God. Day unto day they pour forth. Everything in this created universe that is not evil and wicked pours forth speech that God is glorious. Now, we also have to say a word of caution. This is not just stick your head in the sand, positive thinking. Because you can think about famine. You can think about oppression. 
you can think about really horrible places and things and circumstances in this world. Maybe even that has been a part of your own life. You can look at that. Number one, those are the things that you, you can think about but not dwell upon. Okay? There's a difference. And when you think about as opposed to dwell upon, you should identify that as that's not in these categories. This is not true. This is not pure. This is not lovely. This is not excellent. This is not worthy of praise. So even those, that's why we want discernment, not monasticism. We're not trying to hold ourselves in our minds in this little bubble. Then I'm just going to think about these things, nice little Jesus thoughts, and that's it. And we don't engage into a lost and dying, crooked generation holding forth the word of life. So then, what should we dwell on first? And this is the most important, which we'll stop today. What should you dwell on? Whatever is true. This is the foundational cornerstone of all the other seven. If you lose this one, all the other seven become more meaningless or meaningless in total. This is the one upon which all others are built off of and key off of. This is where Paul says, we focus, meditate, carefully consider, ponder what is true. Whatever is true. Reality. You think about the things that are actual and real, true to the facts. So when, it, when Paul says, the one who is going to stand firm in conduct worthy of the gospel, this is the one who will dwell on whatever is true. They will dwell on whatever is true, not false, not lies or deception. Now we will, in the coming weeks, whenever we get there, we're going to talk about not only how you think about and dwell on things that are true, but then this should lead into practicing what you're thinking about that is true. Okay? It's dwell on these things, and these things practice. And they're inseparably connected, but because of time, we have to separate them. So you, do, you dwell on what is true, not false. Accurate, not inaccurate or erroneous. Real, not imagined or assumed. Now this... If we practice this in our marriages, so many arguments would never even start. If we practice this in our friendships, so many arguments would never even start. We focus on what is real, not assumed. Well, they looked at me this way. So therefore, they must be thinking this. Believing what is not true leads to misunderstandings, which leads to miscommunication, which leads to conflict. Many negative emotions such as anxiety, depression, jealousy, insecurity, anger, result from telling ourselves things that are not true. There's a story that I read in my reading this week of a person who came to church. And he was coming to church, and then all of a sudden he left. And so the pastor called the person and says, hey, miss you, love you. Is there a reason why you're not coming? Yes, pastor. The reason why I'm not coming is because everybody knows what I did. And nobody knew what he did. Started believing and assuming, oh, that guy gave me a look. He must know what I did. Oh, and this guy, he turned this way at the time that I was looking at him. So he must be trying to avoid me because he knew what I did. And nobody knew what he did, not even the pastor. And he left angry from the church because he knew that everybody knew. We focus on things that are real, not imagined or assumed. Things that are objective, not subjective. Factual, not fiction. 
biblical, not unbiblical, or just merely traditional. Sadly, in the church today, the focus is not on dwelling on whatever is true. The focus today is on emotion and pragmatism, what works, and the importance of serious thinking about biblical truth is downplayed. People no longer ask, is it true? But rather they ask, does it work? Or how will it make me feel? Because if it works or it makes me feel good, then that must mean that it's true, is how we conclude. The concept of absolute divine truth is rejected then. Truth then becomes, sadly, whatever works and produces positive emotions. And sadly, such pragmatism and emotionalism has crept into theology. Says John MacArthur. See, when the truth is given over, we have lost heart. And you've seen this. You're seeing this more and more. You're seeing this as it pertains to the definition or redefinition of the family, where the family can mean anything. And it basically means nothing at all. Or gender. Gender is whatever you define it to be, so you can identify yourself as whatever you want. That's why some snarky high school students, when they're getting their license, thought up, well, I'm going to identify myself as a 70-year-old Asian woman because, you know what? Insurance rates for 70-year-old Asian women are really, really low compared to a 16-year-old male. What are they going to say? If Joe over here can identify himself as Mary, why can't I identify myself as a 70-year-old Asian woman? We have lost our anchor. We stopped dwelling. So, ask yourself, Do you dwell on what is true? Do you dwell on the facts? Or do you suck up things that are not factual, like gossip, and you feed on that? Do you dwell on what is true from a biblical standpoint? Because this is the most reflective of all categories of whatever is true, you dwell on this. You meditate on it. Is it your thought day and night? Some practical things. Spend time in what you're reading, especially if it's in the New Testament, it's a little bit easier, to write down just a small phrase. You can say, whatever is true, dot, 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 dwell on these things. Write it down on a little slip of paper and take it throughout your day. Put it in your pocket and just whenever you have free time, remind yourself, am I dwelling on things that are true? What are things that are reflective of truth? Ask yourself that. Are you dwelling on what is true? Especially as it pertains to your relationship. Do I know for a fact of what my spouse just said? Do I know for a fact of what my spouse, not only what she said or he said, but why they said it? Do you know for a fact? Or are you just assuming? Dwell on what is true. Honorable. Whatever is honorable. This word honorable has the idea of dignity, majesty, gravity, that which is grave, as opposed to frivolous, empty, fluff, silly. The word honorable here means that we think about things that are serious, grave, reverent, august. Think about things that are lofty, 
and awesome and majestic. We think about the weighty things. It includes God, but not always because of the whatever. So then, therefore, believers must not think on what is trivial. Think on meaning dwell upon, meditate on, spend most of your, the bulk of your time thinking on what is trivial, temporal, mundane, common, earthly, silly. Rather, on what is weighty, heavenly, worthy of awe, adoration. Things of gravity, not fluffy, wispy, vain, or empty things. Now, you might be thinking, whoa, think on things of gravity, majestic. That must mean I must need a PhD or seminary degree to do that. I'm just a simple person. But it shouldn't mean that to us. Just think about the disciples. Remember, they were mostly blue-collar workers, not educated, uneducated fishermen. Or think about this. Think about the conversations that you would have with kids, either your kids, your niece or nephew, your grandkids. How quickly even children can talk about weighty matters. You know it's weighty because of how you respond, right? Because what would you do if at lunch today you're sitting by one of your relatives and they ask you, they're little, right? Little, little, a five or six year old, and say, Where do babies come from? <laughs> and even how you respond, you understand the weight of someone who is a child can bring up and think about weighty things. I see mamas, and then I see mamas with bigger bellies, and then I see babies. Where do babies come from? Or if they ask, if God is holy, how can we love sinners? How can he love sinners? If God is everywhere, then is he in my milk cup? And if I drink my milk, am I drinking God? If God knows everything, why should I pray? And how come if I do what is right, sometimes bad things still happen to me? Aren't these weighty? It's very, very probable that a child would ask it. And see, we need to dwell on those things that are honorable, weighty. Why? Because when someone asks us a weighty question, we have been able to handle it instead of like, oh, 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 and be stumble under the weight of that question, right? If you do what is right, why do bad things happen to you? You say, well... That is a very good question that the Bible has an answer to. Where do babies come from? Well, I will tell you as much as I think is good for you to handle. So let's talk. And you can handle the weighty things. You can't handle them if you don't dwell ahead of time on the weighty matters. So think about your entertainment and what you read. I'm not talking about things that you do in your discretionary time. I'm talking about as a emphasis of time. Is your life about entertainment and fluff and silly, trivial things? Or are you giving time to invest on the weighty things? The things of gravity, things of majesty, the things that are true. There are other things we have. So may God help us in our thinking that we would think rightly worthy of the God. To do that, so far, we have talked about we need to dwell on the things, whatever is true and whatever is honorable. And we need to dwell on these. So let's pray. Father, we're grateful to you. Thank you, Lord, for being a God who's so patient. As we think about, as I think about my thinking, you, you're so patient. So patient. All the things that flip in empty, vain things that I choose to think. 
and dwell upon. I thank you for your direction, clear direction of how I should think, and what would be best for me, so that I can hold on to the promise and cling on to the promise, rejoice in, will be with me if I do practice them. Think on these things, practice them, to help us. May the words of our mouth, meditations of our heart be pleasing to you, O oh God, our Lord and our Redeemer. Pray these things in Christ's name.